Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth from Gibson's Bookstore and I am very pleased to be welcoming two poets this evening. We are joined by Janet Sylvester and Olga Livshin. Janet Sylvester has published two books of poetry, That Mulberry Wine and The Mark of Flesh. Her third book, And Not to Break, won the Laura Loria Frasca Poetry Prize in October 2019 and was published by Borghera Press in April 2020. We'll ask about publishing during a pandemic later, Janet, but she has begun work on a new collection tentatively called Color Wheel, winner of the Grolier Poetry Prize, a Penn Discovery Award, and a Pushcart Prize. Her work has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry, Tri Quarterly, Virginia Quarterly Review, Georgia Review, Poetry Daily, Harvard Review, and Colorado Review, to name a few. She has also been the recipient of fellowships to Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. We are also joined this evening by Olga Livshin, who holds a PhD in Slavic studies and taught at the university level for a decade before moving on to writing and teaching writing. Her poetry, essays, and translations appear in the Kenyan Review, Newsweek, and Poetry International, among others. A Life Replaced, Poems with Translations from Anna Akhmatova and Vladimir Gondolsman came out in from Poets and Traders Press in 2019. She lives outside of Philadelphia. Thank you to the both of you for joining us. Both of these books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. Um, we do ship, we do offer in-store and pick up. If you would like to type questions during this reading this evening, please do so in the Q&A or the chat sidebar and we will be answering them at the end. Um, ladies, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. So who is reading first? Olga will be going first. We're following, we're going to take turns reading. And then we've decided you made a great suggestion about each of us concluding with a final poem. So Olga will, be, will begin. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Janet and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me at Gibson's. It's wonderful to continue this activity during the pandemic. Um, so I feel very honored to be joining Janet uh, here today. If it wasn't for Janet's mentorship and support and friendship through the years, I'm not sure where I would be. Certainly not here on screen chatting with you beautiful people. So thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your creativity. And thank you always for your wit. I am indebted forever. Um, in my book, the opening poem uh, is called Translating a Life. And it has something to do with this book project. Uh, so Poet, uh, Poets and Traders Press, which is a press in Brooklyn uh, that published the book, is a little bit of um, a particular design. It pairs poets with the folks they translate from other languages. And that enables them to um, kind of include a nice company under the cover of one, as if, as if we're under the roof, there, there is a house and several of us in it. And what it allowed me to do is to bring a few of my literary ancestors with me and to um, revel in their company and to show what um, these two voices, one an immigrant and one somebody who chose to stay in Russia, like my student Crystal Tarasova joining us today, um, what they are, um, uh, these visitors to English, um, the, the dialogue with them, is something that really deeply shapes me and informs my work and um, the act of translation is also something that um, I think people do when they write in general and then we add this layer of another language and so the first poem then is called translating a life someone spread a blanket of wild buckwheat over a meadow someone tucked puffball pillows in each corner of the purple green sheet it is summer everywhere, except war. War where it used to be home, and now war by government here. And what does it matter that the meadow seduces the bees in pollen, or me in lines of a poem, or that I hear perfectly good Russian names for plants, 
and translate them into you and me-ish. Take the tea mushroom, the little fox mushrooms and piggies, the early field dweller, the mysterious cheese eater. These words are undocumented here, and the country that sent them erases every syllable with its crimes. Take an under birch mushroom anyway. It's a choice edible. Birch bolit in your tongue, on the tongue, the language for falling in love with forests and stories and friends does not care who's killing whom. Unfortunately, I care. And sitting here by a huge flowering bush, I see no refuge. What language fantasy could stop us from being murderous strangers? Would you take a Russian mushroom name, tuck it in your lapel for the brief banquet of life? Does that translate anything else for you? Is this how it works? And so that question onwards to a poem dedicated to Janet, who is the person who's shown me how it all works in American contemporary poetry with me as a refugee from the Russian world. Um, another mushroom poem, and this one is called Milk Mushrooms. And it has something to do with familiarity and closeness as well as disconnection. Um, we are mysteries to each other and to ourselves sometimes as people. And um, to me, plants uh, and the natural world is just such a mystery as well. And so this poem is something at the intersection of the strangers that are human beings as strangers and the stranger nature. Milk mushrooms. Woodland sculptures, lactifluous peperatus, milk flowing, milk caps, morning rolls, over their generous white grounds, leaks down there, dwindling columns, wakes them up and they babble. Don't worry, darling, we are the safe mushrooms. You've known us since childhood. We are so happy you found us here in the US. Kneel, please, eat like Alice. I pluck and bite, the mushroom bites me back capsaicin on the lips. Edible but too bitter to bother, the Audubon Guide to Mushrooms declares. Then memory on the lips of famine, war, women run home from work across a field, quick gathering buckets of these garkushki, bitter littles, and salt them, boil and cleanse of sharpness. Hunger, poison, death itself, they prayed, preventable with salt and heat and clean hands in the sink. And wasn't it sad mushrooms granting years of human life, milk mushrooms granting years of Soviet life, cleansed from necessity by the goddesses of necessity. While living in my richest country, I can't clean the world or heal my own mother and father of their time. Mushrooms of stinking milk, the best mushrooms to grieve among their bare soft skins, my pets. We sit and feel exactly what we feel. No one will judge us as to anything, not here on this old playground of the unwarm sun. With dedication to so much that I feel in Janet's poems, their honesty um, that is always delicately balanced against their elegance. You know, how does one achieve both? That sincerity and the elegant speech of Janet's poems. And with that, I pass the baton on to her. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Olga. I would like to, I probably should start by saying one of the more terrifying experiences I've ever had was going on, on a little casual walk with Olga where she started mushrooming in the midst of the walk and talking about eating these things she had just pulled from the ground. I was terrified that we were, would all die soon. 
but didn't, but didn't. So that was good. I would like to dedicate this reading to Olga, um, who has been as foundational in my life as a writer in the last couple of years as she claims that I have been in hers. So thank you for your work and your sweet ferocity um, and your truthfulness. I love them all. Okay. Okay, I will begin with a poem called Marionette Lines. For those of you um, who are not of a certain age or who don't hang out, when we used to hang out at department store cosmetics counters, marionette lines are the lines that go from the nose to the chin as you begin to get older. Both men and women get them, but only women um, mention them, of course, of course. Marionette lines. The English shrink who reports that January 24th is the most depressing day of any year, isn't in this poem on January 25th. Clouds replete with snow, the moon milkily absent, roadside drifts beginning to steam at every corner, already awash with slush. I like winter. I like to have lived through its worst, the solvable problem of the child buried by the plow, the convict's commutation dropped into wet that merely soaks its envelope and crows, dozens of them, bunched like onyx apples on the tree's bare branches above my car. Tonight, it's better not to look too far, Instead, I focus on the oval, the little Christmas tree, untrimmed and living still in its green container, container, breathes clear into the window's icy vapor, down which runnels drip that tomorrow will freeze into pretty snowflake shapes with sun the weatherman assures us is on its way, along with the drop in temperature. Whatever I used to know doesn't matter. My student, who wasn't awarded the scholarship, in a handwritten note has informed me nonetheless, with all of the politesse of Mumbai and many of its syllables, that he thanks me. The insurance man, a few words, assures me that my check's been cashed. A choking and unsayable distress, like loneliness, that overcame me this morning in a waiting room that had flooded and was crammed with industrial fans, all are one thought about what it will feel like someday to be old. A primary care physician, as mine did, examining then lightly stroking the little finger of the left my writing hand, in its ligament and indecipherable ache. Um, the next poem I will read is a cat poem. Um, and I won't say too much about it, but that as you, you will hear, my poems tend to be layered. There's more than one thing going on. They take a great deal of, of time to write usually, not because I want them to take a great deal of time, they just do. I'm the world's slowest poet. Uh, so this poem is called Barometric. After the October sky's unbleached fabric color above the federal building, and God's snapshot of me and the bankruptcy lawyer shaking hands, after a palm full of flawed diamonds sold to a slick-haired salesman, certificates of deposit canceled and debts discharged, there was still the cat who confined for the first time to the house, and he wanted out. Nose to the crack in the door out, still strong enough at 17 to tear the carpet from beneath the lintel out, 
gothic, slowly break ten fingers on a blackboard meowing, turned into a grating howl out. So we would go. Had I not let him stop to sniff the dead end of every branch beside the path that climbs around the knotted veins of the maples, the hill littered with plastic, amber glass, and a quick worm levering its length onto a leaf, he wouldn't, in increments of days, had led me to the meadow, a seminary's yard, overgrown, free in lowering dark. I had the city, its panoramic scroll I didn't know I'd find, and the cat, jog-trotting, as if the walk were something he had to do for urban me. Close reading, a tree's hollow, and the blackberry cane's unesthetic tangle he'd belly crawl beneath and turn around, composed to look at me. I started to clean picking up a can or two each day, something to do while businessmen advance toward polished cars in guarded lots. Like commerce, I expanded, collecting oxidizing springs, socks, a tie, in rain that needled dust to lace. We were nearly happy, the cat gnawing on grass that he might not throw up, the leaking braille of poison ivy blind in its advance across my arch. In bird song and its counterpoint, the hourly bus's diesel grind, the two of us were private hermanutes behind a broken building. Someone driving west into the Berkshires late those afternoons could never have seen or even dreamed us. On an orange leash, a woman deep in rubbishy thoughts walked by a gray tabby through wasteland the masked pike passes. How, as the rain came harder and she bent to lift him, the warm world twisted in her arms. I will read one more. This will wake you up in case, I think, in case I've been putting you to sleep. It's called To a Feminist Psychologist. <laughs> okay, let's see. What I like to say about this poem is the end of it shows where a need for a rhyme can get you in a poem. To a feminist psychologist, Thucydides of the minutes, I can smell your distress. Its inaudible hiss wafts across the 40 inches between us where my heart hangs like panties on a line. Behind my head and to the right, a clock ticks on the wall. Behind your head and to the left, a diploma. You might have been my teenage pregnancy if I had had one. Why am I here? My hands, once still in my lap, now speaking language I can't control. I watch you, note their opening closing, one palm filled with glass, one palm with snow. What I haven't done presses a whetstone, some assiduous incubus I should give up. Thanatopsical, clinically erotic, which are we? This musk adhering to the air can't be love. You're scared. One day, though, you'll be my age. Your forehead's earnest shine will tighten. Your soul will step behind the stock of its successes. Busy women, bleached fresh, back at their desks. Sessions in this laundry room, rocking on emotions dryers long forgotten. By then, you'll be worrying your child, inattentive, often to your wife, strategizing how to cut back on your practice and get by. You'll write poetry, no doubt, stuff that's ornamental and about your life. Am I cruel enough? 
cornflower blue, your eyes widen with concern. I forgive myself for needing you. The rasp of something new moan scours the room. Nonetheless, I want you to accept the fellowship at Minsk to investigate the social lives of fleas. I want you never to be treated as I have been. Harvard Mail statistics favor you. And because I can't yet confidently hope or expect to do, I want to lick your knees. I'll now hand it over to you, Olga. <laughs> well, as Elizabeth said earlier, nobody can top that. So <laughs> oh, what can we follow? You can. <laughs> Were we going to um, uh, take a small break for comments and questions, or are we doing that at the end? I'm happy with either version. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, what say you? Everybody has just been sending in all of their good thoughts about how wonderful the poetry is, but no one's actually asked a question yet. So we might save questions for the end, um, but if anybody in the audience does have questions, now is the time to start typing those in, and we okay. will be asking them in, uh, in, at our next break. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. good. So yeah, we can, um, we can continue. Um, I wanted to continue with a couple of themes that um, I started with um, and uh, that Janet started for us. And the first theme, uh, uh, touching on what I said about Janet earlier, was gratitude, um, an emotion that I feel politically <laughs> flooding back into my life um, and soul. <laughs> Um, here, I'm going to follow this up with a goodbye to the Trumpian times, <laughs> perhaps, um, or we'll see them again. Uh, but um, the people who, as we all did, survived those times, and how did we survive? Um, what did we do to, um, to survive intact? Um, this was written on my very first grown-up retreat, um, aka three entire days locked up in a off-season motel, frozen in November, one fine, not so fine day, um, exactly four years ago uh, in New Hope, uh, where, which is exactly 40 minutes from where I live, but it felt like a very big girl adventure, given that I just moved to where I live. And I said to myself, I shall write poems. I shall be alone. I shall leave my son and husband and cat behind. And I did. And that was the day that the Muslim ban was announced. And people flooded JFK and every airport in the vicinity. And I wanted to be with them. I couldn't turn off the television. So the te television spoke and I spoke back. And this is what came out with a hello to Robert Frost. And the gratitude is to him and to the people who were protesting. Something there is that doesn't love. And that's the title. Something there is that doesn't love the ones like me. Something there is that is repulsed by our sweatshirts, pilled, our backpacks full of bric-a-brac, us detained on the floor, airport animals. Something has claimed that my adopted country's autobiography of openness is finished. Something opens the mouth of my Jewish family to mutter, good for those terrorists to wait. Hope their turn doesn't come. So thank you to all who sprang to protest when something called all the ones like me criminals. Thank you for translating your memory of Babcha, of Abuelita into this mother traveling home. Your translation climbs over the walls, helps us know each other. Gently, it joins our hands with frosts, asking just one more time, why would anyone help? And exactly what doesn't love a wall? The other uh, important topic I'm going to pick up on is cats, of course, as one must. And I swear this will circle back to some of the <laughs> topics we are exploring. So my book is about immigration and immigrants and refugees and the Trump times. Um, it is slightly disorienting to place it in the current context, but um, the reality is that we are all just people on this earth trying to coexist somehow. And how we do that is the biggest mystery of, to me. Um, how are we compassionate to each other in the times, uh, such times and others when we simply are rather different. Um, 
And immigrants are just people um, uh, in the same way as women are just people or gay people are just people. We are all um, here with our respective heartaches and um, issues. And um, some of us don't speak English very well. One of the poets I translated for this book is our contemporary, Vladimir Gandelsman uh, was born in 1948 and he lives near New York. He does spend part of the year usually in St. Petersburg where he was born and grew up back when it was Leningrad. And um, this is one of his poems. It was not included in the book, but it is part of a book project that I'm working on now, which is a collection of his work. Um, I will read other poems by him and some of my responses in a moment, but um, because cats must be honored and because I adore this poem. <laughs> this poem by Vladimir Gendelsman, translated into English by yours truly, is called My Purchases. It does include the word meow, and that's my nod to the <laughs> to Janet. Um, <laughs> my purchases. I went outing, swerved and bought a small thing. What? I forget. I was too distracted. The fall sun snuggled with the sky kitten, calling out meow. But again, I don't remember the rest. The thing could be the sea. Deaf and speechless, it rests in its shimmer and silence not a splash. So I sent the sea to myself, airmail, so that the blue sky would breathe easier without my thoughts. Um, Vladimir Gandelsman came here in the early 90s and um, he was 42 at the time, which is what I'm turning in December. Um, and uh, he did not speak English very well. He was a visiting uh, professor at, I believe, Vassar first and then other places. Um, and um, he found himself in an odd situation where uh, somebody who's very eloquent in his native language um, was here and sort of mute in a way. So there are a lot of images of muteness and deafness and speechlessness in his poems and yet he sort of finds an odd comfort in that a kind of zen um pause and quiet and i think it may have something to do with some of his relatives due to which i'm going to read you a poem uh one of the ones that are his favorites about a very loud parent um and it is called mom resurrected by vladimir gandersman in my translation mom resurrected Wear your coat, wear your hat, you'll get sick, don't do that. Call your mom, call your mom. A storm is coming, a storm, a storm. Get some bread on the way home, get up, it's five minutes till. Hello, I got you a delicious treat. We'll be able to pay for heat. That's for the holidays, why did you open it? What did you do this time? What did, just go away, just beat it, all right? Daddy and I waited all night. How time flies, time flies, your flies open. Those kids, their terrible influence. Get a haircut, your shirt is unbuttoned. You make me pull out my hair. Who do you think we are, millionaires? Don't play hooky, don't be MIA, don't slouch. <clears throat> ASAP, RIP, DOA, time to go tinkle. You've got a frog in your throat. My God, your cough, I don't like the way it sounds. Lie down, lie down, lie down. Don't say that while he is here. It's five till I pop up, my dear. Why did we splurge on that baby grand? Be a man, be like steel, make a stand. He'll be the death of me, the death. Let me feel that forehead, forehead. Don't smoke, you'll ruin your lungs. Don't be rude, don't catch a cold. It rained all night. I know you drank, I know you're drunk. Confess, you're all alone now water the plants. And this is my sort of response poem. I've lived with Gandusman's poems recommended by my own immigrant writer father since the age 20 or 21. And um, I'm so delighted to finally have some time to dedicate to translating him. And it makes me write poems like these. Mom, a liturgy. It scares me that you're with a woman. I'm scared that you'll lose your job. Since back in Russia, you would and also because you are so young. Actually, because you're not that young anymore and should know better. I'm scared that I can't help you. Even my name is spelled wrong in this alphabet. Life continues though. That calm boy, I'm scared that he is not Russian. 
me be less nervous? You're kidding. You're my baby, I worry. Scared for piano and orchestra, performed heavily, heavenly, Beethovenly, and when I can't bear it, scared death, a zero altitude flight over the keyboard. How glorious that he's a yank. Sing, they don't cheat as much. Sing, you'll clean when his mother visits. Sing, you guys won't live like piglets. I'm so happy today, happy for you. When Danny entered our lives, we just knew. He waltzed in so musically and he hasn't ruined things, not yet. I know that you are with a woman. I'm scared that you haven't left him. It's so hard not to know what to tell you. Surely he must be jealous. Don't tell me fairy tales. And if he thinks it is beautiful that you and she are together, then his love lacks fear. And I'm afraid that's not love. Listen to this pretty piece. You say you all love each other, then mention she wants to leave. Why do you get so attached? when it bruises and scrapes you, and I feel it here, right here. And I don't need your language, any language, to know. Scared is not what I am, honey. Scarred is more like it. And you say sacred for some reason to you. Janet. Oh, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, I'm going to do a little publicity for Olga's next project now. She's working on a book-length translation of Vladimir Gandelsmann's poems, which I simply cannot wait for. So hurry up, Olga. <laughs> I'm next going to read two poems, one short and one longer. Uh, the first is a sadomasochistic originally Italian, then French, and then into English in the 19th century form called a villanelle, which is only 19 lines, but has a very complicated braided uh, line structure to it and requires um, very complicated rhymes, which I um, uh, kept to a minimum but it works very well for a poem with a, a more purely lyrical impulse, such as um, something about grief. This is called Field Glasses. As I was writing the villan Villanelle, I had terrible time with one of the repeating lines, and I ended up, which is called a refrain, I ended up looking up the word refrain in the dictionary. There are some of my students here I've seen, and that'll sound familiar to them. And it turned out that the, the deep, uh, the me medieval, uh, English and French uh, version, uh, actually medieval French um, source of our word refrain came from Provençal and it was refrania, R-E-F-R-A-N-H, which means bird song. And I thought, ah, oh, beautiful, you know, uh, nature is so deeply at the sources of poetry. Field glasses. Though bird song shelters in the word refrain, that stallion, several mares, and pair of foals, the water meadows utter, stand in rain, and noisy geese lift wings, black tip to stain the sky above the reeds, the wind unrolls as their song shelters in the word refrain. I know that loss has nothing left to gain today from me. I'm made of parts and holes, personified as standing water in the rain. And still, the afternoon's gray circle drains ditch water into oily flame. The cold's outside and in, despite the word refrain. Six horses the ocean once contained, half drowned, half swam across the shoals, then jumped the meadows in the water, climbed the rain to turn to me their dark regard. Darkly sane, 
a dream the world invents of time unfolds inside a water drop. The word refrains from Provençal, which spoke in birds and rain. I've never written another one, by the way. <laughs> that will be the one. Okay, next I'm going to read a, a very different sounding poem called Baby. Um, and this, you know, settle back in. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, Baby is another kind of voice entirely. This started as a performance with another person. I wrote it in two voices and then gradually rendered it down to a poem for one voice. Baby. Baby for a long time has been reading a short history of modern philosophy. It doesn't console her. Marxism's lasting value doesn't console her. The death of timelessness into history can't console herself, self, self, aware, alienated, realizing. She accumulates like surplus value, years recorded on a driver's license. Too much wonderful self to go around, she goes around a fit of peak and torque. She hopes for a modish personality disorder and poof. Her wish is granted. Her shrink, forgivably, yawns. The sound of baby's loves, a ticking escalator in an empty airport somewhere in Bahrain. Now baby yawns. The sound of her loves, the infinitesimal wrinkling of a tea bag drying in a saucer in the 12th arrondissement. The sound of her loves, the wheeling death of a moth in a web strung between branches of sagebrush in Utah. Baby doesn't want to, A, change, B, not change. A blue, not cerulean, ultramarine deepens her. The sound of her love is the glide of notes in the throat of a thrush beside an abandoned barn in New Hampshire. Listen up, boys. Baby is not a mommy. Baby's a baby. She puts the entire world into her mouth. She tastes a leave, the satin glide of taupe in a nightgown, the moss and rust of light, thirst which is closed, hunger's blood-tinged tongue and beating heart. Why is baby's word? She yelled it out the window of the car when she was eight. Naked in morning sun in an arroyo, she slid it into a rattlesnake. She stroked it into the small of the back of every man she loved, breathed it on the eyelid of her stillborn daughter, caught it, catches it still between her teeth at academic meetings. She's filled with the surplus value of this feeling. Hours of unpaid labor accumulate with textile slowness, lengthening like bruge lace, a halo of candle flame illuminating her as she yawns. The sound of her love is one dark look. It could go on and on. Baby considers object relationships. Baby considers the wing and the blade. Rain-soaked, she's marked the curve of an ache. The sound of her love is astral dust. The sound of her love is molecular water caught in salt in a meteor billions of years ago. This, by the way, is not a love poem. Love's expensive, she says. Love is just way too expensive. When she's in it, she's a pig in dirt. When she's in it, she's a wagon load of devils. Poor baby. A mirror teardrops onto baby's brow, across her cheekbones, into the indent above her upper lip, along her hands. Once upon a time's hidden geometry, which baby intuited rather than knew in the endless deferous deferral system called her mind, baby met a stranger. She shook the stranger up and down. She tapped its sternum. She listened to its head, which rattled slightly, dog-like, devoted. She dragged it like a doll by one arm, back and forth 
back and forth. She dragged it into a village built around a garden. Svelt with tears, she laid it down. Weak with power, she opened and closed its eyes, smoothed its fingers, kissed its little hands. Ein Mann und eine Frau, the tune wafted out of a summer house near Prague. She crossed the song, a metaphor, a footbridge giving up its distance. She kept walking. It was a sing-along. She sang, spit and sinew, gauze on water, the law of beauty rude in a world of kitsch. The doll, which she had almost forgotten, took on weight. It sweated at her effort, pulled her to her knees. She aimed one well-placed slap at its painted face. It aimed one well-placed slap at hers. Counterweights, they used each other. They rose. Oh, dear, it was much, much taller than she. Now a man, where they played at statues. Baby spun and froze, hands on her hips. The man continued to spin. A spinning penny, he defined one edge. Baby, not a dissimulator, hoped A, he'd save himself. B, in the parking lot of the Mall of the Emotions, he'd sink forever into spewy asphalt. He stopped. The thought he thought she thought was not the thought she thought she thought. Why, said Baby. He watched her, not with the gaze of an infinite number of eyes which Baby was growing used to, not with the gaze of the eyes of many friends, those she would recognize, not with the gaze of one in love, that's presence, but with the gaze of one who's absent, who lives in imagination. Baby, used to being top banana in the shop department, waited. She was at his mercy, he at hers. In me thirsts, he said. Starved out, baby bathed in the fog of the phrase. Talk English, she complained. In this, he smiled like a Czechoslovakian novel. Why, said baby. At this, he smiled like a Roman pastry powdered with gold. Baby was no longer yawning. At this, he smiled like an Aztec priest jacklet by luxury. And so... Dear listeners, our tale concludes at its decisive moment on a dirt lane in a foreign country under trees studded with leaves large and star-shaped beside a fountain weeping gardenias into the fizzy early evening air. Baby is a fresh horse on a lead line. Baby's a wagon load of language. Baby is your surplus in a world of labor, hard and unremarkable. Baby is what's left over when you go home. The sound of her love is your sleep. Thanks. Are we still planning uh, each to conclude with a poem? I would like that very much, but I think right now, if our audience has questions for our poets, we should have our questions now before we end with our last poems. Oh, great. That's a that good, good idea, Elizabeth. So our, to our audience members, if you do have questions you would like to ask, uh, please do drop those into the chat sidebar or Q&A function now. These books are available from Gibson's Bookstore if you are interested in acquiring them for yourselves. We'll have our first question here. Olga, when did you start writing poetry? Do you write poetry in Russian? If yes, could you comment how different it feels for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ksenia. Um, a friend, yet another gift from the internet. Um, um, yeah, um, Let's see. I think, Janet, you've asked me to read this poem to you first. My first poem <laughs> written at the age five with great interest in the colors of fall and the textures of falling leaves and crunching around. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I was a child and wrote poems in Russian with rhyme and rhythm the way one should up until the last maybe uh, 20 years. Um, Russian poetry rhymed and rhythmed. Um, and I, along with it, uh, was lucky enough to have a dad who mentored me into it. And um, 
uh, to a lot of uh, Russian speakers, American folk poetry feels like something else, a totally different art form, um, sometimes a bit um, illegible um, because it has a very different kind of musicality, uh, right? Um, although rhyme and rhythm are once again upon us, rhyme separately and rhythm separately, and that's a bigger conversation. So I navigate between these two, just like with everything else in life. So I spontaneously start rhyming and rhythming in the middle of a perfectly um, a free verse poem uh, sometimes. And um, I think I do do that more than um, fellow, you know, certain fellow contemporary um, authors. Uh, but what, you know, Janet actually helped me discover is the musicality of a line, right? A poetic line that has to end sometimes in the middle of a sentence, but the, it sort of flows into the next one. I was rather confused by these American enjambments. Why is everybody using enjambments? One foot in one line, the foot in the other. I think I somehow got the, um, the zigzags, the zigzags of passion, the zigzags of emotion, the zigzags of cha-cha-cha, of something lively through um, our conversations. And um, this is kind of how at least I read them. So they do feel like very different um, poetic forms. Uh, Russian poetry is becoming a lot more like American poetry though as we speak and there are some beautiful works being written in it. Um, I have not been writing in Russian since my last major attempt to um, resettle in Russia uh, when I felt it and um, since then I felt relatively American. And, um, this is where I live and work and the Russian voices are voices that I hope I can invite and include. Um, but yeah, I'm an American poet. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sylvester, what was the motivation to write in two voices and blend them into one? Is that something you've done before? Uh, no, it wasn't, in fact. Great question. Um, I was challenged. I was teaching a workshop and I was challenged by the students uh, to do a, a performance. Uh, poetry and performance, of course, poetry has always been performed for thousands of years, but it has become much more, um, uh, readings have become much more church-like and reverential as they've, you know, been taken over by the academy. And so I was with a, uh, bunch of students who really wanted to see me bust out of that and uh, one of them planned he was connected to people at a museum in Boston called the revolving museum which I like to say revolved right out of existence eventually um, but so I actually worked with um, a young uh, playwright who was the second voice um, and I did the writing and we first practiced the performance on the stage at American Repertory Theater in Cambridge when they were dark. It was very funny to take it, take that over. So it sort of freed me to be this other poet. And then though, um, I felt that the poem was worthy enough to keep as a poem and um, to turned into one voice because it's got enough going on in it as it is so so that's where that came from and it was a great exercise um and whenever possible you know i think it's wonderful when poets can can get out and leave the kind of confined reading paradigm that had has taken over um, and we're kind of going more back into it because of Zoom right now. We can't do too much on Zoom, but um, someday Olga and I will read and we'll, we'll cut loose. <laughs> Thank you, you for that. We're not doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Being very reverential. <laughs> I have been very reverential of you for good reason. <laughs> I'm never reverential. <laughs> Uh, Kate asks, have you been writing new poems during the pandemic and has your writing, the writing itself and the way you approach it changed during the pandemic? Oh, I feel as if, um, oh, I feel as if, <laughs> as if it's um, one of those things uh, where, you know, 
have you written your next magnum opus in the time of the pandemic? Right, yes, I have. It's called The Iliad. I'm the original <laughs> author. I've been around and I'm here to read it in its entirety. I hope you have at least a year. Um, I have been um, writing about uh, my um, plants, to be completely stereotypical, because uh, I have been growing various things in my backyard. I have not started anything to do with sourdough. I will never go that far, but um, uh, I think plants used to mean Russia in my work, and now they just mean their beautiful selves. And um, I'd like to think that somehow, uh, somewhat the pandemic is teaching us the value of mindfulness so to see various different things in the shape of the same fruit or berry um over the course of just a week as it evolves has been a very fun experience um uh, between that and being in um uh, nearly solitary confinement with my uh, nine-year-old child uh, who notices and is already very mindful uh, and that has been wonderful and other children that I started to teach over Zoom, which is another gift of the pandemic. So overall, I think I've done well and um, I will share the Iliad right after Janet shares her odyssey. Go ahead, Janet. <laughs> um, I am completely incapable or virtually incapable of writing occasional poems. Like if someone's getting married or someone gets sick or someone has a baby, I could never be poet laureate of England because part of that job is to produce endless occasional poems. I may write about the the pandemic in five years when it's over. Uh, but at the present time, no, uh, it's too overwhelming to me and horrific. Uh, I am working on the, the Dante project, which involves taking a poem that's in and not to break called Courtesy, which has reference to that circle in hell it's about a, a liar. Um, and I'm going to write, turn it into a triptych with a kind of purgatorio section and then a paradiso section. And I'm just about, I've got about three books of the purgatorio left to read. Um, uh, and I can't wait to start writing this next poem, which is so far from anything that's going on right now. It feels life-saving in fact so that's my that's my answer yeah uh, doug would like to ask how do you feel about other people reciting your poems given that it seems delivery is so important hi doug um, <laughs> um i think it's fine i think people um reading you know you know that in class i recommend that you all read everything aloud if you can, essays, stories, whatever. And I feel the same about poems. Poems are music in the mouth. So read them aloud so you can actually taste that music, that texture. Um, and, um, you know, when, the only time I don't like poems read aloud too much is when professional actors and actresses read them because they can become too stylized and rigid in a weird way, like over melodramatic almost, but to, to see somebody mumbling a poem as they walk down the street makes me very happy. All right, so I have some questions here. Both of you write about animals and nature, especially cats. Uh, <laughs> tell me about your relationship with your, between your poetry and nature. Your, your turn, Olga. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a relationship with nature. I don't know. Have I been seen recently with nature? Um, <laughs> I just, one of the effects of the pandemic is we have an extra cat. So I, again, again, it's a great time, not really. Um, we, our next door neighbor passed away and we inherited the kitty. Um, let's see. Um, I, um, I had a perfectly lovely answer prepared for Doug, so I'm still sort of milling about and was about to praise something Janet said. Let's see, what was I going to praise? And then I'm going to segue that into the magical relationship with nature yeah. answer, yeah. As, as one must. Um, yeah, um, I think what Janet was speaking about regarding the 
um, somebody over dramatizing. I've definitely had that happen before. Um, uh, once, <laughs> all of the one time that it was read, um, it was delivered rather exactly as Janet described it. I couldn't have described it better. And I was like, what? But, boy, but why? I said, but why did you take away the epigraph? I asked them afterwards. It is an epigraph from a Russian poet. And they were so surprised. They said, there was an epigraph? And the rest of it was delivered in such a loud and dramatic way that I almost was like, but the three of you read it, but one of you could have been Maria and Sotaiva. And I started directing them and they're like, go away. Um, other than that, I think one of the greatest gifts we can actually give each other is to read each other's poems. And I picked that up from Janet. So I work with kids, um, uh, different ages. Uh, and one of the loveliest thing they can do is read their works out loud and then I read it back to them. Um, and I think they pick up on a lot more and I pick up on a lot more uh, in each other's performances, the different ways of interpreting it, um, different words are emphasized. Um, there are various different emotions conveyed and um, certainly the whole meaning changes based on if things are read ironically. So it's really interesting to see a child who sometimes, you know, once they relax, right, out of all the shyness and the inability to hear their own voices, you know, they, the meanings they invest are very different meanings from what I see and it's always, a real surprise. Yeah. So I feel like that's really a blessing. And then, um, yeah, to have to have your work reread um, and and comforting to them as well. So if you have children, I think at least one person in the audience has a granddaughter who's studying with me. So certainly, reading their works and reading them out loud is just such a fun present that we can give each other. Um, as far as nature goes, um, I did in fact nearly. Uh, shock Janet into <laughs> quiet a swoon over some mushrooms on a very hot Pennsylvania day, but um, definitely, uh, you know, nature as something that I always associated with hiking with my father when I was little in the Moscow area. Uh, we did that every weekend and then um, he had to learn how to drive and how to speak English and how to use a computer. And then we did eventually go on some road trips, but it was much more connected to my childhood. Um, so for me, that's just as a human being, it's something that I had to actively pick up again and, and, and do, and I've always missed my father doing it. Um, so nature has always been sort of sad and nostalgic and bittersweet and all these things. And then recently, uh, only recently did I realize just how much you can see in a um, small flower or um, the neighbor's cat and how much your relationship with a living animal actually changes over time as well and these things are not one meaning um, they're not fixed in time they're not fixed in space they're always unfolding and it's a beautiful beautiful world out there and I think it makes me a little bit kinder towards like um, people actually because I see that we too are animals and we too exist coexist with these raspberries and mushrooms and kitty cats and you know, we're alive what a gift and in terms of me, I mean, to go back to the poem I read, Barometric, you know, the, the a great American poet named A.R. Ammons once wrote an essay called A Poem is a Walk. And of course, the, the source of that is the British Romantic poets, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge in particular going out and, you know, at least the, um, the publicity Wordsworth gave out that, you know, m much of his writing was done while he was walking, communing with nature and the spirit of nature. And then there's me, who does, I go out and do things like get, get seriously lost in the woods. I also believe, though, that I want to see not a romanticized version of nature because of who, how my eye works. Uh, how I perceive things. I like to write about nature as it is, as much as possible. And so, for example, in Barometric, I'm writing about picking up junk, you know, on the hillside, uh, beer cans, ties, a sock. Um, that's what nature is now. It's filled with plastic bags and, and things that people have thrown out. And I believe that's just as beautiful or can be as the pristine nature untouched by man. There's hardly any place on the planet left untouched by all, say, humankind rather than man. Don't want to just blame men for that. Uh, so that's my answer. All right. Thank you. Um, 
One last question, I think, or well, two more. Uh, Janet, what's it like publishing during a pandemic? <laughs> Well, I won't say what I'd say if we were just sitting around a table having a glass of wine, but it, you know, the, this was a book that was a very long haul. It was 20 years since my last book, and I was thrilled when I got the acceptance on October 1st, and in fact, I had been hoping, this was before the pandemic began, I had been hoping it would come out in the fall, like September or October of this fall, but that the press made, Bordighera Press made the decision to bring it out in the spring before we knew what spring would be like. So we had the launch party planned in New York and I had, I was going to stay in a hotel as a treat rather than with friends. And then there was the day in late March when everything got canceled, right? So what I did instead was hosted a launch party myself, just with no planning, really. And um, on Zoom, because I teach on Zoom anyway, and we had a wonderful time on the publication day, but it's very hard to, I'm missing the, um, usually after a book comes out, you go and do readings and you're with people and there's a lot of hugging and appreciating and, you know, uh, this odd thing to be doing ever, let alone in a pandemic. And so um, it's, been, it's been aerobic, but um, I feel that some people make an extra effort too to try to imagine what it must feel like and they make the, the path a little easier. Thank you. It's absolutely true that Zoom events are wonderful and thank goodness we have them, but it's not the same human connection mm -hmm. that in-person events have been. Mm -hmm. um, our last question, and then I think we will leap into your final poems. Uh, Paul asks, do either of you ever feel trepidation before publishing, especially given some of the vulnerability you share? Go ahead, Olga. Yeah, um, thank you uh, to Paul and with a quotation from Pushkin in the original. Beautiful, uh, something to do with a Pushkin poem about staying up late at night and um, trembling, fluttering, um, uh, having all these emotions about doing creative work, uh, all that creativity, uh, but not erasing the lines. And um, I don't mean for this to sound like a card game that I'm going to put down the other poet card, um, but I think I have some Joy Harjo to quote back. And to me, uh, she's been such a wonderful uh, model for somebody who is who identifies as an American of a particular kind um, and with a difficult past. Um, and who finds beauty in traumatic experiences um, and even in her own anxieties. The very, very famous poem that she sometimes just calls fear poem um, that she wrote, I think, at the age 22 um, you know, when she was dealing with addiction and poverty and, and just a terrible life situation. And she claims that this poem saved her, but I think she's saving herself and all, all of us. Um, and to me, the, well, the way she talks about fear here is. Um, she takes it out of herself and places it to the source. Where did it come from? Um, I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. And she goes on to say, you're not my blood anymore. I give you back to the white soldiers who burned down my home. And then she says, she says many, many, many more graphic things. Um, I had, you know, I, I was the scholarship kid in the room, right? Like I went to the private school and I went to college and I had a professor who incessantly made fun of my accent. And, you know, I had the graduate school experience par excellence in Slavic studies where sometimes Russian writers are analyzed as it were in, with a mixture of amusement and a slight bit of, um, I would say kind of critic, necessary critical distance, but like a little bit of like the disgust that one feels towards a culture that is um, considered to be backward by everybody in the room, but we just won't say that out loud because that wouldn't be nice. So kind of a parallel experience to um, not open racism, but 
implied, right? So um, been there and I don't want to feel it anymore. I feel like, you know, having reached somewhere between 35 and 40, it's a great liberating age for women to no longer be the little girl in the room. And in my case, to be the little immigrant kid who's always striving to speak English correctly. No, I give it back. Um, I don't need the fear from, you know, who am I going to have a trepidation with publishers? Publishers are like our allies, they're like our best friends. So no, um, but you know, it's, it's not easy finding a little spot for oneself in one's world. And I guess I would say that I don't necessarily want to identify it with some kind of mainstream American culture. I want to find that security and that voice within myself. Like her, Joy Harjum, may she live. A very long way. And, and you know, I feel I'll, on the one hand, I'll be very, uh, this is, a, well, I'll quote a romantic poet, John Keats, who said, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And the thing is, define truth, right? What are you actually seeing? What, you know, can you write toward a truth rather than sentimentalizing or prettifying? Um, the law of beauty is rude in a world of kitsch. Um, that's Milan Kundera from, from the unbearable lightness of being. Um, kitsch is, is, as he says, the absolute denial of shit and death. And we can't afford to deny those things anymore. Um, we, we're, we're not even slowly trashing the world. It's very important to acknowledge them. Um, so, yes, occasionally vulnerability, vulnerability in itself is no problem. It's the reaction of some creepy people to it. Um, and I'll save those stories for, for private conversations. <laughs> but, um, but no, that's, that's the job of poets. That's, that's our job now. Thank you. So would you each read your final poems? I think it, it may be my turn. So, um, yeah, I was inspired by some of the questions about recent times. Um, and in general, um, you know, translating Gandasman and writing some of my own work, I've been really drawn to the exterior world where before it was memories and um, you know, um, various emotions arising, kind of looking at oneself. Um, I've been inspired and I really love the energy that I feel like um, is stirred up in me by translating Gandasman and also by working with children and by the pandemic and just sort of looking to the outside. So I'm going to read one of his poems that is directed towards the outer world um, and then one of mine about those um, pandemic experiences in the backyard, <laughs> the great, great backyard experience. So this is one of his in my translation, and it is about New York, where he's lived now since the 90s. In the Bronx's bronchi, the subway train wheezes leaning, where the sunset's bronze pours into faces. This is housing, scattered building frames in zoological ribs ablaze. In fri Fridays, fevered and striving, worn things masquerade lights. These are small piquant smokes, alcoholics barns, asking yet backing away, yet backing away. Rockabye baby, I hum getting out of the way. This is garbage flickering always, whether a blue evening puts its heavy elbows on the table, or a fool gazes, daydreaming. Endless muscular basketball hovers from hook to hoop, quivering. Rockabye baby, good night, sweet dreams. Sleep now, not like the grown-ups, always dreaming of some big party, or else a trash heap. Any spectacle is a sorry one, unless snow blankets it all by Christmas. Mm. And here's one of mine, and I'm just going to make my screen adequate to the Zoom screen. This is on the computer, and it's called a raspberry pandemic. Mm. How they moonlight as strippers in my backyard, joyous raspberry nipples, redden, soften into the hand. Only a girl will notice with some satisfaction the little hairs 
sticking out of the berry. My dear and I, our exits now exhausted. This garden exodus, our calm play. The plague, but look, fruit. Rows and rows of semi-spheres stacking up to an inverted tower. A juicy tower? A message? It's curlicues, still, silly, rococo-ish. Plants feel no pain, pain designed only as part of the fight or flight, supremely, exquisitely helpless. Oh, defight, delight, come fly with me. Have you ever seen such sexy koans? Before the virus, there were phones to look at. Raspberries in the nude to think they had been here all along. To eat one at long lust with a naked mouth, an animal gorging on seeds. Yay. <laughs> okay, uh, my last poem is actually the last poem in the book, and it's called, um, perversely, Prologue, which means beginning, of course. This poem was written um, at least 10 years ago, and the reason I'm reading it now is because it seems to have been written in a time of disaster. It's about that, in fact, and about the day that um, uh, things begin to get better. I like to end on that note. So this is prologue. Last night, we fell asleep before the end of the world. Another lengthy TV special. Bursting gamma rays, rogue asteroids, super volcanoes, latent nuclear fiascos. Awake until computer technologists created intelligences turned against us, we didn't wonder why. To be human is first to try to flee, but then to burn, drown, freeze, and gasp with surfeit and or lack. The two bouquets of dahlias, burnt orange and lavender tipped, shading to purple that you brought back from the market and mixed, drank hard anyway. Their stems thickly visible in a clear vase, their petals candle flame shaped, perking up. When we awaken, the end of weeks of drought and the seventh and final threat to existence coincided. The worst news wasn't hard to try to bear. A flooding fragrance, sweeter than the dahlias, streamed through the open windows. Dirt, cream, parsley, burnt sugar. We opened the door to the porch that hot ghost had pressed against for so long. Very, very much to each of you. Thank you, everybody joining us from uh, your home. And thank you to Janet. Thank you to Olga. Thank you for sharing your poetry with us. This is a balm to the soul to have art in our lives again. It has been a long month, even though it's only half over. It's been a whole month in half a month's time. Thank you for joining us this evening. Both of these books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.